So thank you to those that are joining us. We are here to listen about downsizing your stuff and right-sizing your life. My name is Katie Hendrickson. I am a senior living sales counselor here at Riverwoods Manchester. Uh, Riverwoods is hosting this event, uh, but the person that you are here to see is Joe Scott, Director of Move Management for Dovetail Companies. So a little bit of housekeeping before we dive in. Um, everyone is on mute and your cameras are not on. So if you try to ask a question, we will not see or hear you, but we utilize the Q&A box at the top or bottom of your screen if you're using a tablet or a laptop um, all throughout the presentation. So any questions you have, please feel free to type them in um, and we will answer them at the end of the event. Um, so we always look for suggestions too. So if there's a way that we can improve this webinar, or if you have ideas for a future event, definitely let us know. Um, we host many throughout the year and we're always looking for bigger and better topics. Um, but you are here for one of the best, uh, which is all about that daunting topic of downsizing. So before we talk about downsizing, we wanted to give you a little bit of an informational blurb about our community and the type of community that it is. So Riverwoods is a continuing care retirement community. So for those of you that are joining us, some might already know what that is, some may be on our wait list, some may say never heard it before. <laughs> so what is a CCRC? So a continuing care retirement community, we like to say is both an insurance product and a lifestyle choice. Um, what it is, is prepaying and insuring for any care needs in the future. So you still move in while you're independent and live life to the fullest. Um, you get to enjoy everything that the community has to offer, but you don't have to worry about if you needed assisted living, memory support, or nursing in the future because it's guaranteed to you. So for us, our contracts are regulated by the state of operation, uh, which for us is New Hampshire, um, and is reviewed annually. So we submit our financial performance uh, to make sure that we're on track, um, and Riverwoods has excelled in this manner. So if you have any questions on the community, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, but what we offer is, you know, carefree living. Um, there's transportation, there's um, activities, there's outings, there's fitness, there are committees you can be a part of, the list goes on and on. Um, it's a very, very cool concept. And if you have any questions, feel free to type your information in the Q&A or reach out after the event. Um, we're half, happy to talk about it more. Um, so on our next slide, it actually shows about how our Riverwoods communities work as a whole. So we have three locations, Exeter, Manchester, and Durham. Um, Exeter was the first community to come online and has grown to three different campuses. And Manchester and then Durham were next in line. Each of those have one campus. Um, we have a board that we work with, as well as um, a CCR board, CCRC board and a system board, excuse me. <laughs> um, and they help fund, you know, at-risk projects. Uh, they support HR, IT, et cetera. Um, but we all work cohesively as a group. Um, we have three individual communities, but one mindset, which is to better the lives of our residents. Um, so again, any questions you have, just let us know. Um, but with further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Joe Scott. Um, he is very familiar to the Riverwoods communities. He has helped many of our residents and been given very high reviews. So <laughs> Joe um, has been in this field uh, for a combination of 30 years. He uh, was interested in this topic when he moved his mother into an assisted living, if I'm correct, um, and really wanted to pursue making this process easier and better um, for everyone. So he has a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of resources that he has worked with um, or knows about, and he will talk to you all about really tackling this task, if it's from the beginning or further in, 
he's your go-to and I'm very, very excited to have him speak to you today. So Joe, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> and welcome to all of the participants from all over the, the country. That's really impressive. I wish I was in Tallahassee, Florida, where I think it's probably a little bit warmer than it is here in Massachusetts. I wanna tell you a little bit about Dovetail Companies and our leadership team. Dovetail was started by Aaron DiCarlo and Lauren Watts as a way to provide a single point of contact to older adults in transition. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. I handle the uh, move management um, division of Dovetail. We have 35 people that assist in downsizing, right-sizing our, our clients, packing and moving them. And then Julie Ford is our director of home sales. We really think of what we provide as the best of three worlds. And it's the planning that goes into deciding where do I want to go? Is it time for me to go? Do I stay home? Do I age in place? And that's one thing that uh, we work with our clients in helping them make that decision. We then work for those clients who decide to, to move. We work with right-sizing and eventually moving them. And then finally, we are a seniors real estate specialist. Uh, we are all realtors. Uh, Aaron, Lauren, Julie, and myself are realtors, uh, licensed in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and are part of the Compass, um, uh, the part of the Compass team. And Compass is the largest national uh, realtor uh, in, the, in the country. One of the things that I would say about that is that it really helps us in um, serving clients that are coming from out of state to uh, to Riverwoods because it allows us to really tap into that national network. So while you don't have to choose all of those services, um, you you can avail yourself of the planning, the right sizing and moving and, and also it's selling. We like to call downsizing right sizing because the process is really very different for every person. And what is right for you and the possessions that you have may not be what's right for the person who is sitting next to you even. So we really like to, to say that it's a process that feels right for you and brings you contentment and makes you comfortable in your space and allows you to function in a way that really um, allows you to live your best life. As an example of this, um, I was helping my 84 year old godmother who decided to renovate her kitchen, she's aging in place, and I was helping her unpack her kitchen. And we were unpacking and she had four sets of measuring cups. And I said, Judy, do you need four sets of measuring cups? And she said, well, yes, when I bake, I don't want to have a cup measure that has just been used for oil. Then I have to use it for measuring flour. And then I have to clean it out to measure some, you know, uh, molasses or something else. So she said, no, I need four. And we always say if it fits in the space and it's safe, it's going with someone or it's staying with someone. And if we had taken the prescribed method with Judy or with any of our clients of downsizing where in the last 15, 20 years, we've heard a lot about, you need to be very specific about what you want. You need one of those and two of those and four, you know, four sets of dishes, whatever that is. And if we go by that prescribed method, it really doesn't work. It's really individual. And we always say, again, if it's if there's room for it in your space and it allows you to, to function in the way that you've always functioned and it, it, um, it's safe, uh, we will absolutely uh, encourage clients to, keep, to move it or to keep it. Whether you're right-sizing or interested in right-sizing just to um, stay at home and get rid of 30 or plus years of, of uh, contents, or you're right-sizing because you're moving to a beautiful community like one of the Riverwoods communities, it's something that has to be recognized as an ongoing journey. It's not once and done. And you will continue to live. That's the beauty of, of um, you know, man recognizing it as a journey is that just because you right-size at that point in time, it doesn't mean that you're not going to continue to collect things. We're going to talk about where did it come from, um, right? And, and it's going to still come because you're still living. We'll talk about, you know, why is it still in the house? And probably the, the biggest question, the most popular question we get from clients is, how do I get started? That's, it's, it's great for us to say, you know, this is what you should look for and, and uh, where you should, you know, where you should focus. 
but how do I get started? So let's talk about where it came from. You know, you have lives that are well lived and the good news is that you'll continue to live after the right sizing process, regardless of where you are. You'll continue to have monumental life events. You may be dealing with in the right sizing process, photographs, awards that you got when you worked, gifts that you got, birthday cards that you saved. You'll continue to get those. You may deal with the inventory of what you have right now, but you're gonna continue to get those. Staying current, we all do it. We do it while, we're gonna talk about paint in a second. We do, we, we paint our bathroom several times just to, to give us a fresh look and stay current. We get tired of the pillows that are on the sofa. Um, so we take the ones that are on the sofa and we put them in the closet. And that's okay to stay current. And you're gonna to continue to stay current just because you have gone through the right size process doesn't mean that you are stuck with everything that you have right now and it can't change. So recognizing that you can still stay current by you know, uh, adding new accessories to a room or, or changing curtains or those kinds of things. If you end up in a beautiful community like Riverwoods, you don't have to worry about painting anymore, um, but you can really certainly stay current. And, and we'll talk about how do you deal with the item once you've decided that it's no longer serving you. We, things have come from our hobbies. We have taken um, you know, classes on painting, wood carving, fishing, stained glass making, all of these things. And what comes with that is not only the equipment that you need to do it, comes all of the things that you created that you weren't able to either give away or you don't feel comfortable with where you landed with it. So it ends up in a place, it ends up in a box, it ends up in a, in a closet. The beauty of moving to a CCRC is that you can try so many different hobbies and you don't have to own all of the, the materials, right? Uh, as part of the activity programs, they're there for you. But you can continue to pick those up. You can you can pick up a new hobby. You can learn how to never knit, or you can learn how um, you know to do something that you've not done that you may be doing in your home, or your apartment. You can pick that up. It doesn't mean that you know you stop living. So you just have to know what do I do with what I have created. And when I get sick and tired of this new hobby, what do I do with all the stuff that I, I purchased to, to, to dive into it? It comes from the store. We all have done it. We've all walked down an aisle and seen something that we want. I did it just recently, and it was a perfect example of not being thoughtful with replacing it. I had a can opener, and we have a dog, and I use a can, the can opener to open the dog's uh, dog food can. It was an old rickety all metal can opener and it was very painful to use. So I was walking down the aisle in the supermarket and I saw an OXO good grip, very comfortable can opener. I brought that home and I put it in the drawer. And then probably a few days later, I was like, why do I still have two can openers, right? I didn't deal with the one that I replaced. So it's okay to do that as long as you're thoughtful about, do I need it? And if it's replacing something, it needs, it, it need, it either has to be thrown away because it's broken or it has the potential to be donated or given away. And then we've all collected things because we've received someone else's stuff. Someone else has someone the result of someone else's right sizing, right? I, I'm a I'm, I, uh, uh, candidate. I, I received my Aunt Helen's Governor Winthrop desk. I had no desire for that desk, but I ended up getting it. I moved out of a house uh, about a year and a half ago that I had been in for 22 years the amount of things that I had collected in my basement for my sister who had moved so many times was ridiculous. Kitchen table, to, to uh, dining room table, beds, a bureau, all of those things, just because we had space, we ended up you know, storing it. The beauty of moving and after the right sizing process, you should feel empowered to say, I don't have the space. I don't have the space emotionally or even physically to house any more of your, any more of your stuff. I told you we'd talk about paint, and this is actually a photograph of an effort I took um, probably just about two years ago, because I moved in uh, a year ago uh, last August. I had been giving this presentation in so much, and I had really started to think about, well, I should start practicing what I preach. And I had taken all of the paint that, I, that was stored in the basement and put it out on, the, on a table. Um, and then I dealt with drying it out, you know, the latex that could be dried out and the other hazardous stuff that couldn't be um, put in trash. I, I used it, I saved it for the hazardous waste day. 
But the thing that was really interesting about it is that if you look down the bottom, there are a few shades of green. Those are the shades of green that were used to paint a bathroom in the house. I saved those because there were going to be touch-ups that had to be done. They were never opened. So that final green that's sort of in the center, uh, bottom center of the of the screen, that final green was the last green that was 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 painted. The bathroom was painted. The two to the left, they were never touched, but I didn't get rid of them. And a beautiful thing that I discovered was you'll see there's some navy blue paint, the navy blue paint can there. That's from a bathroom I painted in the house we lived in before we moved. So there's a 25 year old can of paint and I paid someone to move that to the house that we live in. So um, paint is always one of those things that I think tells uh, is really a good place to start. And it's probably in the basement because it's really out of sight, out of mind. And not till you start thinking about, do I have to get rid of something? Do I have to address my space? Do you really start thinking about it? We have things in the house because they represent something. Um, I always like to say, if, if people are saving paint because they have a, a strong emotional attachment to it, we probably should be doing another kind of webinar. But it's really important to understand, why am I keeping it? Is it best for me to just give reverence to it and find a, you know, a new home? I'm saving it for someone else. I did a clear out in a home, beautiful home for clients who had moved to assisted living and her son was managing the clear out. It was the kind of home that was pristine. And, and to give you an example, she the, the client had white silk upholstery in her living room. And her son told me that regardless of whether it needed it or not, she reupholstered that furniture every five years for the 40 or 50 years that they lived there. So everything that she had was very well taken care of. She had, you know, got bought, you know, purchased the best of the best. And she had, you know, Waterford, Yadros, Bilroy and Bach, China, um, beautiful uh, uh, furniture and art. And the day, one of the days that we were there, I was telling the son that we we're going to start staging things for donation in the basement. And he said, you know, please just that box that's up against the wall that includes, you know, what I want to take. And I looked at it and I said, can I ask why? And in the box was a gold plaster of Paris, large eagle, some velvet hangers and a Bodum coffee press. I said, I can understand the hangers and the Bodum coffee press. I said, but why the eagle? And he said, well, my wife's going to kill me when I bring it home because there's no way it's going to be in our apartment um, in the city. And I said, well, why are you taking it? And he said, well, every single photograph I have of my brothers and sister is underneath that eagle. So that meant something to him. And I said, you know, it's really interesting, John. If you were to say to your mom, what does John want from this house? The last thing she probably would have said was six hangers, a Bodum coffee press, and a gold eagle. So we don't want to save it for someone. We want to make sure that we are uh, designating items that people actually want. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, it's in the house because we just don't have any idea. We have no idea why something is, is where it is. I always challenge clients in these sessions, you know, once you're you're done, go to the kitchen and stand in front of your kitchen sink and to the right or left of the kitchen sink or cabinets, and if you go to the top shelf of either of those cabinets, you're going to pick up something that you have no idea that you have it. A couple of um, sessions ago, I was getting ready, and I thought, I'm going to go do that myself, and I did, and I ended up with a can of Nudge coffee bombs, no idea where they came from, and the thing that's interesting is the only things that we store in that top right shelf next to the sink are all of our dogs' medications and ointments and all that stuff. So it was really interesting that that ended up there. So I had no idea. So I didn't donate it. I keep it now as, as a prop. But it's really common to have things that we have no idea why we have them. Clients, as I said, always want to know, how do I get started? It is an unbelievable task. I say, do not attempt to boil the ocean. Meaning that if you try to boil the ocean, it's never going to happen. And I uh, think that's akin to going down the basement stairs, standing at the bottom of those stairs, and that is the ocean that's in front of you. 
don't attempt to clear out that entire basement or boil that ocean in one fell swoop because it's not going to happen. So we say take it one room at a time, buy inventory of items. And we'll talk about why that's important. And also in very manageable bites, be realistic about what you're gonna get done when you get it done. Because not only is it going to be physically exhausting to, to sort through items, it is going to be emotional. Even if you think that you have no emotion attached to anything, as soon as you pick up something that represents something to you, you will have emotion about it and you will question, can I get rid of it, right? So we say, start with things that have low sentimental value, things that have where you have no emotional attachment. Paint is a perfect example of that. You may be right-sizing to move in a year, two years, three months, six months, whatever it is. So when you're doing the going through that right-sizing process, you want to think about how am I going to continue to live? What, what does my, live, my life plan look like in terms of my housing? So you want to take a look at what do I need now to keep living the lifestyle that I really enjoy living? If in six months you are you know that you're going to move, don't get rid of the things that you don't get rid of that dining room set because you know it's not going to fit in your your new home. But don't get rid of it because you could, you're going to continue to entertain for the next six three or six months. Deal with that at the end. Deal with all the other things that you're not using now. Don't um, don't sort of leave yourself. Uh, bear of all the things that that currently bring you joy in your new environment. When you go to your new environment and you don't have them, you may miss them, but you will have found something else to replace whatever it was that you had. Maybe you're taking a portion of the dining room set and not all four or five pieces that came with it. It's really important to develop an inventory, especially if you have a lot of things that you want to um, give to family or friends. And it can be very helpful to go through and list all of those items. It can be, you know, if you have extensive collections, if you have art, if you have furniture, um, go through, develop that inventory and ask everybody what it is that they really are interested in. You'll be very surprised when you go through that and what someone will say they want versus what you think that they want. They don't want that china. They want that gold eel that was above the fireplace. So it's really important to develop the inventory so you know what can be managed. And a really important thing about in, the, having that inventory and asking someone if they want it. And I thank a uh, attendee at one of these presentations of, uh, a year or so ago. And she said, once I found out that my children didn't want it, even if I was emotionally attached to it, once I found out that they didn't want it, I lost all emotional attachment to it. So she felt that by asking and knowing that they didn't want it, she said, I lost all guilt about throwing it away and felt totally comfortable, you know, donating it or, or whatever. So really important to develop an inventory and have a list of those things. You don't have to do it for every item in your home, but for those things that you think people may be uh, potentially interested in. And then finally, ask for help. It is, as I said, a physical and emotional uh, task, and it can be exhausting. And it's really easy to go through when you have someone else helping you. It's, I say to spouses all the time, to couples, it's really tough to go through the process with your spouse. You have very different approaches to how you want to do it. You have very different emotions about some specific things. You question why you know, you know, Bill questions why Mary loves that. You know, Mary questions why, you know, why does Ruth love that? It really depends uh, on sort of, it's very individual. So it depends on that uh, feeling that, that folks have as to what their approach will be. So sometimes asking for help, asking for a neighbor to help or your, your you know, niece, nephew, child, whatever, it really is helpful to have that third party provide some guidance and assistance. When we will send out to you our right sizing guide, and our right sizing guide gives you some uh, some detail that we'll, we, I've talked about in the presentation, but it also includes a worksheet for you to begin making the plan, um, and we call this the emotional and functional scale. So starting with things that have very low emotional value. So I always use paint as that example, and it's a great place to start. You can free up some shelves in your basement or wherever you have been storing it. 
it's a great place to start. And making a small change like freeing yourself of pain, you'll be surprised with how it fuels you to move forward. Another example I like to use when someone's moving to a new community or they're downsizing in their home and or they're they're going to age well in home at in place at home you know you may be losing a bedroom um so a good place to start is the bed linens that you're not going to need and you know you haven't used i always say you know you go into your linen closet is always the 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 towels and the sheets that are on the top are always the ones that we've we've taken very rarely do we all take the effort to first in first out and all the stuff that's in the back to the front. So it's a good opportunity to start looking at that stuff. If you haven't used it, likely you're not gonna have any emotion attached to it. And it's a really good place to start. I think once you build some momentum and you're fueled to move forward, you can go ahead and start working on the things that may have some emotion attached to them. And this varies by, um, by person. You know, em emotion may be, you know, an, an, end, an end table in the living um, to someone else, it may be, you know, a collection of Hummels, whatever that is, um, start thinking about how do I deal with that, you know, that inventory of items or that specific item. And then thinking about, you know, we'll talk about how do you pick what you would, how much or how many of something do you need? Maybe it's beginning to start to take a look at that collection and say, either I want to get rid of the whole thing. I know that nobody wants it. I'm going to donate it all. Um, but sometimes collectibles can bring on emotion because they were given to you, right? You got them as gifts over the years. Um, they were passed down to you. So they do, even if you decide that you want to get rid of them or are comfortable donating them or giving them to someone else, there is emotion attached to that. And it's going to be you know, something that you're going to have to recognize. I often say the guest room is a place that has emotion. And why that's true is that you wouldn't believe the number of client homes that we go into, people that have been in their homes for 50 years um, or more, and their guest room where their kids, you know, was originally their kids' rooms, some of them still have all their kids' things in it. They sort of left it as it was. And that's a very emotional space to deal with because the kid has already come home and you've said, go, you know, go through and take whatever you want out of your room. And they took nothing. So then they're left with dealing with that. And that becomes, that's very emotional when you sort of take that apart, right? I've had other situations where um, couples have had, you know, their, one of their aging parents, you know, stay in that guest room. So that, that guest room has a very um, emotional feel because that's where mom or dad, you know, spent the last days of their life. Right. So it's really difficult to sometimes walk into that room. But I will say, regardless of what's in the room, the closet is always used. Right. There's always um, the overflow of sweaters. There's the luggage. There's those pillows that we thought, you know, we would just replace because the other ones were old. There's still something in that closet. Um, that you need to, you know, probably deal with. So deal with what's the inventory that's in that closet. And then finally, those things that have high emotion. Um, I, you know, say photos and memorabilia, but if someone is into books and, you know, you you are either into books or not, right? There's, you know, there are the, the those folks that are in the middle that are occasional readers, but if you're into books and you have a really large collection of books and they're important to you, Books is a tough thing. And I always say to folks, take books in 1.0 and 2.0. Take books on in the sort of some emotion. Just get rid of reference guides that you know are outdated. Get rid of duplicates. Um, because what happens with books, especially if you're a collector of fiction, is you know, you sit down, you you find that book, you take it out, and you go, Oh, I remember this book, and you sit down and you read it, and that you're to, you know, you're, you're not making any more progress. And then you think, I can never do this. So with books, it's, it's one of those things where I always say 1.0, 1, 1 start getting rid of all the books that have really no insight, you know, no, um, you have no use for, you know, encyclopedias and atlases and travel books that, that really, you know, quickly become outdated. But photos are one of those things that also um, brings a lot of emotion. We, we 
you know, often come across a photo album that's, you know, three inches thick, and it has every single picture that was developed out of a roll of film. And we all went to CVS, we dropped off our film, we got it developed, we got it back from vacation after our vacation. And every single photo that was in that envelope ended up in a sleeve within that photo album. It could have had, it could be duplicate, it could have a thumb in it, it doesn't matter, we put it all in there. So what we say to clients sometimes is, you don't have to get rid of all of your photos. Let's go through the photos, get rid of those that have thumbs in them, get rid of the duplicates, take them out of those albums and put them in. We, you can buy, you know, like 12 by eight inch, so almost like shoebox size photo boxes that keep the photos um, uh, from fading. And you can keep those photos. You can have them in, you know, put them in order, put a rubber band around those uh, for a specific period of time. And then you can always have them. You don't have to get rid of them. But you'd be surprised how many photos you can get into a box that takes up the space of a shoebox versus the space it took up are all those, you know, three inch 1970s and 80s photo albums that have, you know, really filled up the house. So that can be a process to go through. Um, but I always say, don't think about having to get rid of them. You know, people say we should digitize them. Digitizing photos is very expensive. I'm very much a fan of just saying, let's go through and pull out the ones that are important and let's keep those and keep those in a, in a plastic uh, photo safe uh, bin. And then, you know, memorabilia. I talked about, you know, the things that you may have gotten, awards that you may have gotten for your philanthropy, for your, uh, your work, like throughout your career. Those can be a real walk down memory lane and a real, it's a realization that that, part of your life is over. So you need to pay reverence to what those items are and recognize that it will bring a lot of emotion to you. So you can imagine if you started with those things, you would very quickly lose any ability to um, move forward because you'd feel like every everything you touch was going to have this is going to have the same reaction as the memorabilia did. Functional timeline or the functional scale um, against the manageable by timeline. What do you need to maintain your lifestyle? Don't give up all of those things that you need to live your your um, your life as you live it now. You're deciding in two years you're going to move. There's a lot of things in your house that you can get rid of that you're not going to need from now until two years. I use dining room set as a as a uh, as an example because, you know, we we all bought those dining room sets that could last through the apocalypse, and they they would they probably still look great. They an earthquake they they're not going to be destructible because you spent two thousand dollars on that from Ethan Allen and it's beautiful. Um, no one wants that entire set, but you use that set in entertaining and you're gonna be entertaining from the time you, from now until the time that you end up moving. So don't get rid of that. And I always say to clients, let's think about how else you can use that in a new space. Maybe use the table with no leaves and just four chairs. Use the bottom of the China cabinet as uh, an entertainment center underneath a, a, a well-mounted television. We do that a lot because it does provide a lot of great storage, but it's also great to bring a really beautiful piece of um, furniture that you've had for such a long time to a new space to give it familiarity. And then, you know, linens is another example of that. You have two extra bedrooms. You're on the next two years, you know that you're going to entertain over the holidays. You have your brother or sister coming over the summer. So whatever that is, you're going to need all those extra sheets that you have for your guest room. So don't get rid of the extra sheets, get rid of all those, all those sheets when you need to get rid of them. I think people take, you know, Take, take it sometimes too too far, get rid of too many things too soon. Um, yes, you can get rid of what you absolutely know you don't use, you know, the linens that are in the back of the closet, but don't get rid of the ones that you know you're going to need. Clients then say, well, how many do I need, right? And we say, apply the 80-20 rule. And the 80-20 rule is, suggests that 80% of the time, we use 20% of what we own. And so we'll take that approach when we work with a client. So I have Mary's sweater example, which is a hypothetical one. Bob's is, Bob's golf shirts is a real one. We'll talk about that. 
But when we say to a client and they have to start going through their clothes, we don't say, let's go to the primary bedroom closet and, you know, let's take all those things out and clear it out and we'll, you know, we'll then fix all that. That's a mini ocean in there, right? We say, let's take all of your sweaters. And probably Mary has sweaters in a, um, a plastic bin under her bed. She probably has them in every guest room closet. She probably has them in, um, in some dresser drawers. So take the entire inventory of sweaters. Don't just deal with the sweaters or the, all the contents that are in the closet. Once you've dealt with sweaters, deal with slacks. A, a good example of this is when I, I told you that I had moved and I'm a cook and I love pots and pans and all those gadgets that you need. And I was deciding on what I needed for pots and pans. And I had pots and pans that were stored in the basement, in the kitchen, and in the mudroom closet. I got all of those pots and pans together in the kitchen and decided on what I, what ones we were going to take and then donated all the rest. In the process of doing that, I made some small progress in the basement, in the kitchen, and in the mudroom. So the same is true with Mary's sweaters, right? Mary deals with her sweaters and she makes small progress in the guest room closet, in her dresser drawers, in her primary bedroom closet. So we say to clients, take out, let's take all of your sweaters. We're going to count them and we're going to say, what's 20% of that? And I'm also, we're also very aware of where did the sweaters come from? So the ones that are sort of right in the middle of the closet or the ones that are easily accessible um, are the ones generally that the client is going to choose. So we'll say, take 20% and we'll say, all right, 20, if 20% is 20 sweaters, and we've had higher than that, believe it or not. If 20% is 20 sweaters, pull out 20 sweaters. The client inevitably is gonna pick out the ones that we pulled out first, and then they're gonna go through and get you know, 15 more. And they have their 20. And I said, okay, then I'll take a look at what else do you have? But what else do you, what, what, what other ones do you need? You're gonna have space in your closet for them. So let's take a look, what else? Oh, I don't know. So then we take all the black sweaters. We put all the black sweaters together. We take all the blue sweaters, the white sweaters, and then say, let's deal with the inventory within the inventory, right? So you need all of these black sweaters. Yes, they may be different in style, but do you really need them? And when was the last time you wore them? And when a third party asks someone, when was the last time you used it, wore it, whatever, is very get a very different response than someone that the person's close to. Right. So what if your spouse said, well, what was the last time you used that? What's your reaction going to be to your spouse versus me saying, we really was the last time you used that? Probably going to be very different. So sometimes it's easier to get someone else to ask you that question. And then you'll end up with, a, you may not end up with 20% of what you had, right? The entire inventory. But you, it's, I guarantee that you will end up with less than what you started with if you take a look at the entire inventory of things at once, do it with slacks, blouses, scarves, hats, shoes, all of, you know, all of those inventories and take them in manageable by its inventory by inventory. Bob's golf shirts. Uh, this is a real example. I worked with a client who had a closet. His side of the closet was full of golf shirts. And you can imagine that he was given some, he had some pressure to, to get rid of them. And I did the same thing. Take, the golf shirts out that you, you know, you wear, you know, pretty frequently. And he took out maybe five, you know, it was small, very, it was a very small amount. And then I said, I looked at those and I saw that the size was extra large and it was extra large, the size you're comfortable with. And he said, yes. I said, well, can we sort through, do you have any larges or, you know, anything smaller in there? And he said, yeah. I said, you're comfortable getting rid of all of the larges. So we got, immediately got rid of all those because we knew he was going, he not going to use them. We came across this very faded, you could tell that, that it had been hanging on a hanger for a long time. It was a very faded knit uh, golf shirt. And I said, what about this one? And he, he said, no, no, no. That, that's the shirt. That's when I got my very first hole in one. I was wearing that shirt and he kept that shirt. He then said, all right, I can, it's, it's fine. That can go too. And I think that that it was easy for him to let it go because had he told his spouse, this is the shirt that I got my first hole in one, the spouse doesn't want to hear that again. 
right? He was able to pay reverence to it for someone to react positively to that, right? And then he was comfortable to let it go. I let him keep it. He had plenty of room because he had gotten rid of so many golf shirts. I then had a client um, who had false craft china. And on the bottom right of the slide, you'll see a, a, a photo of that. I always, every time I go to a thrift store or, or, or Salvation Army store, I always look for a piece of that to have as a prop. But the thing is, they sell the entire set when when um, when they sell them. So I never end up with a piece. So I'm sure you're all familiar with that um, that pattern. This client had hundreds of pieces of this um, dinnerware, and they had cups and saucers, mugs, salt and pepper shakers, butter dishes, casserole dishes, pitchers. They had everything that comes with this set. And I said, wow, you've been collecting this a long time. And Mary said, well, I get, I've been getting this for gifts since the 80s. Probably the last five or six, 10 years or so, she hadn't been getting it. But she had gotten that for every single Christmas, anniversary, birthday, Mother's Day. She got a piece of false grift china. It was stock full of china, cabinets full. And I said, well, how much of this do you use? Well, just really the plates and the bowls, cereal bowls. So I said, well, let's just take six. There had to have been 16 to 20 plates. And I started at, I went to the back and started at the bottom of the pile. And it looked like those plates had never been used because it was constantly just used at the same time back and forth from the dishwasher, right? Just putting them on top, never rotating. And we ended up with six plates. And then we took the cereal bowls and we took the um, the uh, dessert plates. And then when it came to like the butter dish, salt, pepper shakers, all those things, I knew because they were in the cabinet, they weren't using them. And they were comfortable to free themselves of all of it. And we ended up donating it all. When we came to the mug, so this set of, dinnerware has a very strange looking uh, cup and saucer. The cup is really wide and, sh and shallow as opposed to, you know, tall and thin. And uh, so the cup and saucer, and then they had a footed, like a, a mug that was sort of on a pedestal. And I said, well, how many mugs? We just need, do, do you use the cups and saucers and the mugs? And they said, no, we don't use those. We have a mug collection. So the next cabinet over, it was a double cabinet, was full of mugs. And I said, well, let's go through the mugs. And the mugs were important to them because they told a story. They had mugs that they had purchased, like stoneware mugs, hand uh, thrown mugs. Um, they had mugs from Disneyland, World Greatest Grandma, um, all of that. We put all of those mugs aside. I always say to clients, we don't want anything that has a chip in it because if you throw that in the microwave, it's going to be like molten lava when you try to touch that handle. So you don't want a chip or, or crack in anything. So we get rid of those. And then there were so many of the, you know, from the local bank, from the insurance company, you know, just random mugs that had been collected. I asked if they used those and he said, no. So we got rid of those mugs. They ended up with a still like a pretty considerable collection. And the thing that I liked about that, the, the collection of mugs is when you move to a new community, especially you're going to meet a lot of new people. And it's so important. It's difficult sometimes. I'm I'm kind of an introvert. So it's difficult sometimes to sort of, how do you get conversation going? And I think the, you know, having a photograph there or having something that you can tell a story about is great. Have someone over and, and you know, give them a cup of coffee in one of your mugs that has a story. It is a great way to sort of start a conversation. So I shared that with them and they were, they were really thrilled. But that, um, each, each one of those, the sweaters, the shirts, and the dishware, each one of those events ended up in several boxes of um, items for donation. And I'll say that what I did is I, I tried to take items as we packaged them up for donation because I don't, you've made the tough decision. And, and when you go through and do it yourself and you've already made that decision to, to not take it, Put that box in the car and drop it off at Salvation Army. You know, get 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 it out of sight, uh, and recognize that it was great progress that you made. This is the um, worksheet that's in our right sizing guide. Super helpful to begin listing out um, those things starting on the left that have no emotion, 
right? And what is the right timeline? What's the manageable bite? Is it, you know, for the next, from now until the end of April, I'm going to do this. For the month of April, I'm going to, you know, a month of May, I'm going to focus on this, et cetera. And then um, list those items. And then it's really good to um, do this because it gives, it at least has a plan. It doesn't mean that it's set in stone, but at least gets you thinking about what are those things that I can start really focusing on? And then once you focus on them, this is uh, an example of some of those things that I think are sort of on the very on the left hand side, right? The the very low emotion, um, and I may not have reduced that um, you know population down, but I'm certainly going to have reduced um, a lot of what's there: paint cans, paint thinner, those things, the junk drawer. How many times, how many menus do we have? And we have duplicates of menus and we don't even know which one is the, well, I guess we know which one is the most current because the price is the highest, right? Um, but junk drawers is a great place. The pantry is a great place to start where there's no emotion. How many times have we thought, oh, I need curry powder for that recipe. And you come home and you already have three <laughs> curry powders in the kitchen. Like go through your spices, get rid of immediately those things that are not, um, that are uh, expired. And if they're, not open and not expired and you're not gonna use them, donate them to a food pantry. Um, plastic wear, the amount of black plastic containers with the clear lids that we all collected during the pandemic when we did take out, the amount of those that all of us still have, me included, is, is staggering. It's really great to deal with those uh, and give those, give those away, especially to like um, senior centers or, or places that produce Meals on Wheels, they really like to have those containers. Pots and pans, as I said, is a really great place to start. Getting rid of duplicate tools. You could have, you probably have a screwdriver in a small toolbox that's in the laundry room, probably have a screwdriver that's in the junk drawer. You have screwdrivers that are downstairs in the basement. What are, you know, how many of those, how many Phillips head screwdrivers do you need that are of the same size? Clothing is really a great place to start, especially as the season's ending, right? As, as winter's winding down, thank goodness. Um, what did I wear this winter? Did I wear that, you know, those two L.L. Bean jackets? Did I wear all of those sweaters, all those flannel shirts? And why didn't I wear them? They, they're too big. They're too small. They're too faded. They're too whatever. It's a good time to say, you know, what did I wear? What, what have I worn in December, January, February? Seasonal decor, it's always great. You, if, if you know, whatever, you know, holiday decor, seasonal decor that you have, did you put it out this past season? Um, and did, you know, did, did, you know, or did you put out in, in any of the past several seasons, right? It's a good, uh, it's an opportunity for you to, you know, take a look at that and get that um, donated. And firm uh, companies like Savers or Salvation Army, they, you can donate it now if it's all, say it's Christmas, um, or you're going out to put out spring decor and you know you're not going to use that for Cynthia or wreath or whatever. Put it all out. Get, donate it all. If they have storage space and they will save it all, if it's Christmas, for example, they save all the Christmas stuff and then put the Christmas stuff st out starting in October. So you can donate it now and they will uh, likely take it. There are realities in this process. And I think the one that is the most sobering and most disappointing for our clients is that family or friends may not want any of your items. And I say all the time, you you will make this effort to go through and reduce what you have with keeping something or saving something because you're saving it for your nephew, your son, your brother. And they come by and say, I, I don't want that. How deflating after going through that entire process to then be faced with you know, a disappointment of, oh, I could have gotten rid of that or I was disappointed with that he didn't take it. It's really, how do you you know, go through the house with your inventory and say, what is it that you want? That's far more, you, you feel far more energized by that than you do by someone rejecting what it is you may have saved for them. There isn't a market for all items. Clients always think that, um, well, I can sell it, it's worth something. That beautiful dining room set that doesn't have a scratch on it um, is built better than anything that is out in the market now. Very, very rarely do we find a resale value for it, unless it's mid-century modern furniture. Um, there is a market for that. 
And the reason the market's saturated is that everyone is in the same position you are. Baby boomers are in numbers retiring and doing this. So the market is really flooded with um, lots of beautiful um, furniture that's in very good shape. People are setting up homes now and not paying attention to the quality as we used to, right? So they will go to, you know, Crate and Barrel or Pottery Barn. They're fine paying $1,100 for that dining room set, right? Because they know that in, you know, five years when it changes, they can go buy another one. They don't, people don't buy or set up homes the same way we had set up homes. You don't buy something that is going to be my bedroom set or that is going to be my, you know, my dining room set. And if there is a market for items, sales prices, sales price on those items really fall short of expectation. It's always that you're always going to get far less than you think something is worth. Brown furniture, that beautiful dining room set, that beautiful bedroom set, those beautiful, you know, uh, cherry queen and end tables and coffee table. Um, there's just not a market. And again, it's because the market is really saturated with all of that now. So items are really given uh, a, a best given a new purpose. We work with a lot of um, organizations that assist um, families in need with setting up homes. And we visited a lot of these, one in particular, where they set up individual showrooms for you know dining room tables, living room sets, uh, bedroom sets, et cetera. And then to watch people walk through and sort of test out the kitchen table, you know, does it fit? Is it good? And they choose something that's used. And that I, ever since then, I've said that brown, you know, a brown bedroom set or a brown dining room set is better than no bedroom set or no dining room set. So items really are given, um, you know, best given a, a, a new purpose. Really important to know the value of what you are selling or donating. It's really important to understand that um, does it have value? And if someone wants to buy it, making sure that you're getting a reasonable price. And if you're going to make the decision to donate it, what is the value so that you can write that off? How do you manage all of those um, items? They can do it, you can do it through donation, um, either through uh, dropping things off yourself. There are lots of companies that will come and take things. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those resources. You can sell items. Um, again, it's really important to sell uh, an item that you know is priced appropriately. If you know that a piece of furniture is from the 18th century, or you have a painting, or you have a vase, or something that you know is of value, let's get it appraised before you think about potentially selling it. Um, and it's really very important that, that you do that. And then sometimes donation is a better option than selling. Um, you can spend forever trying to sell something and get $75 for it. But if you go by the IRS website, there's a publication 561, and this is also in the right sizing guide. And then the Salvation Army site also has a resource. And it gives you a value of how much can be written off. So you could sell it for $75, but it was a sofa that was in fair condition and you can write it off 200. You always have to deal, you know, talk to your tax advisor, but sometimes you're better off donating for the tax break than you are selling for it. And then finally, um, disposal. Um, there, we, there are junk haulers that we use that will come and take items that need to be, you know, disposed of. Most of it will, we, we always want to make sure that most things get donated, but there are some things that do end up having to be disposed of. And we want to make sure that we have a hauler that can really get the, um, the, the items to the proper, uh, place for proper disposal. And there really are resources as well that we'll talk about to help you with that. So managing the right sized items. Um, there are professionals, I said third parties, it's always helpful to have a third party. Uh, move managers and organizers, if you choose to use one, I, I suggest that you get someone that is certified, either through the National Association of Senior and Specialty Move Managers or the National Association of Professional Organizers, because they're going to know the best uh, way, the best process by which to, to follow to help you in the process. Professionals will have a broad network of vendors, um, but there's also so many available to us now. I was at a, this, I did this, this uh, presentation at an event in Wellesley and I was looking up something on my phone and the, the, a woman said to me, 
it's like your encyclopedia in your hands and it's true. And the internet is our best friend when it comes to trying to find the right resources. So there are appraisers, auctioneers, estate sellers, and um, you know their, their consignment stores. We don't see as many estate sales as, as we used to since the pandemic, especially. Um, but we do see auctioneers still. Um, the important thing that we always tell clients, if you are going to, if you're considering having stuff go to an auction, know the value of it beforehand. Because an auctioneer is going to come in and buy a lot of items that they want to eventually auction off. They want to make a profit. So you may not get as much as you would have you had presented it to someone who was a specialty buyer. So it's really important to, again, know the value of what it is um, before you, you know, give, give it away. And then there are um, consignment stores. There are you know, a few uh, here and there. We don't see as many of those as we used to because of what has happened online. Um, there are a lot of consignment resources online. Um, anything from you know the real real, uh, which is very high end, uh, you know uh, designer label things to Poshmark to others. That there are lots of consignment stores online where you put you put it online, um, and you send it into them. They put it online, they market it, and then um, it's available online. Online auctions are very popular. Uh, Max Sold is a national organization that does organize. Um, individual auctions. I find them to be a little bit more expensive than Auction Ninja, which is a, an option. Um, An Auction Ninja is really an, an engine or a product that individuals can use. So we use a, a company called Bird's Nest Auctions out of London, New Hampshire, and she does an amazing job, but she's an Auction Ninja auctioneer. So what happens in those auctions is they come in and catalog everything, take photographs of everything, put it online, Everything starts at $1, but you'll be surprised as to what items bring far more. And I'm always aware of, before we do these auctions, pulling out the items that I think have some, um, you know, have some, val you know, some value because inevitably you'll see them in the auction and they get, they're getting bids and bids and bids and bids in action. So you think, oh, am I really getting the right deal? So it's really helpful to work with a really great uh, online auctioneer. And what they do is they coordinate the pickup of that. They don't let you, the the people know, the buyers know what they've purchased. Um, I'm sorry, um, the location that needs to be picked up until the day of. Uh, so they'll say you have, or, or day before you have to be there tomorrow at 10 o'clock to pick up that table. Um, so they do all that coordination. Donation centers, um, you know, there are savers. You know, I, I think savers is really a great option because. It is the best place to, to get rid of stuff, right? I always say that today I want you to go get a box and I want you to start collecting those things that you don't need. As soon as that box is full, bring it to Savers. And the first thing that should go in that box is what you take out of the top shelf of that cabinet near the sink. There are nonprofits, Goodwill, Salvation Army, Habitat for Humanity. Um, and a re really terrific resource is donationtown.org. And what they do is uh, you put in your zip code and it will tell you who is available, uh, what organization will pick things up in your area. Big Brother, Big Sister, the Epilepsy Foundation, American veterans and Vietnam veterans are really good. So what they do is you can, you can set up a time to pick things up, for them to pick things up on your porch so they don't have to come into your house. And then um, you set up that time, if it's Tuesday at nine o'clock, you know, it gives you a goal. Tuesday at nine o'clock, I have to get that out. So Monday, over the weekend, we're going to deal with all of the, the clothes that we want to donate. Online resources, I say beware um, because there are so many, so many scams. Buy nothing. Um, there are resource, there are there's an, act, an actual organization called Buy Nothing where you can post something and someone will take it for nothing. Um, there are a lot of community pages within. Um, Facebook, uh, buy nothing, you know, buy nothing Portsmouth, buy nothing um, Exeter, whatever, where you can post something and you could leave it out in your, your step and, and someone will pick it up. Facebook, um, you know, community pages and marketplace. I say be careful because we had a client that was scammed um, um, for uh, $3,000 and he was embarrassed that it happened to him, but these scammers are brilliant in terms of getting people to, to do that. And then finally, yeah, I don't want people in your house, right? So 
if you are going to do that, you can do a meetup. You can say, let's meet in the police station parking lot. Um, you could have someone there and it could be, you know, certainly there for you, um, you know, on the front stoop. And then disposal companies, municipalities. I know we're coming up on the end of the hour. Municipalities are um, a really forgotten and very valuable resource. What does your city or town provide you? What, is, what are the reuse and recycle programs for hazardous waste, textiles and paper and electronics? And also with some, you can coordinate the pickup of items. Uh, you can either purchase a sticker or cert at certain times you can put items out on the, on the curb. Maintaining this lifestyle after you've gone through it, get on a six month cycle. If you're a collector of sweaters, you still like to buy sweaters, you still like to buy blouses, you still like to buy vases, whatever it is that you like to buy, get on a six month cycle and address those things. Thoughtful shop and don't you know limit the bulk buying. Um, but you'll be surprised at the amount of space that you'll free up by uh, not having so much uh, in bulk. One thing in, one thing out, stay current, replace those pillows on the sofa. Uh, don't put them in a closet, right? Uh, put them in that box and get them donated. And then finally touch it once. If you touch it and you say, why do I have it? That's perfectly, it's a perfect time for you to begin uh, uh, the box for donation. We will send out to you our right sizing guide. It includes all this information and, and some additional items. Um, and again, recognize it's a journey. It's not one and done. Uh, ask for help and take it in manageable bites and don't dare try to boil the ocean. Thank you so much, Joe. This is also one of my favorite webinars um, because it's useful to everybody. It doesn't matter sort of what your plan is. Um, right. You can take a lot from this. Um, Joe, if it's okay with you, we have a handful of questions. Sure. Are you willing to stay a couple Absolutely, minutes extra? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, just before we get into the questions, a reminder, you can type them into the Q&A box, either at the top or bottom of your screen. Um, before we kind of get into the first question, we do want to let you know of two of our next events. Um, so on the next slide, uh, we have a very, very exciting topic. Uh, which is Train Like Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, so Bryant Johnson will be uh, presenting in this webinar and talking all things functional fitness, uh, which is a topic dear to my heart. Um, so this is March 6th at 1. Uh, there's a QR code on your screen. You can either use your phone camera to get to the registration link or just go to our Riverwoods website uh, to sign up. It'll be just the same format as today's webinar. Um, we will be giving out a prize of 10 of his books. Um, so if you attend the event, uh, put your name into the chat and you will be entered to win one of his books. Um, and then after that, uh, we have our spring season of a New Hampshire real estate guide. Um, so tips and tricks, if you're planning on selling your home or maybe just getting it ready uh, in the springtime, again, you can use the QR code on your screen to register, but also a very popular event. So please join us and there will be many, many more topics after this as well. Um, so without further ado, let's dive into some of the questions. Uh, this first question was written at the start of the webinar, but maybe we, I can elaborate on it to just say starting points. So this person says, if I plan on moving in five to seven years, how do I, how do I downsize my house now so that when the time comes to put it on the market, I am ready? What would be your recommendation, you know, it's, five to seven yeah, years out? That's, you know, having a long runway is beautiful and in, in, in your best position to be in when you're not you, you not you don't have to move in six months. If you're moving in five to seven years, you you can go through your house right now and get rid of the things that you absolutely know that you haven't used and you won't use from now until move day in five years. So it's a really good place to start. If you have emotional things, if you have a collection of books or you have collections of other things that you are ready to part with, you can start getting rid of those. Right. Um, because you have the time, you can sit and go through the books. You can sit and go through the collections. And also, if there are items that you don't use that potentially you think there's a market for, whether it be silver or some specific art or whatever, and you, you're not using it or, you know, it's it's um, stored some, you know, stored away, 
you know, it's a great opportunity to start getting rid of that. I still think it's important to make a list, right? When are you gonna when are you gonna start dealing with those things? Maybe deal with the stuff in the basement that you have no to paint. Start with all those things, and start start with your clothing, you know, and and just you know start small. Um, but the it really is great to have a long runway and not to be faced with a six month timeline. Thank you. I agree. I like the the quote, don't try to boil the ocean. So giving yourself more time definitely prevents that attempt. <laughs> um, so next question is, I am an Exeter resident. Do you recommend a local moving company to move me into Riverwoods? If so, which one? I'm on your wait list. Do you know of ones in the area? Yes, we work with, um, well, we work with three movers. There is um, Gentle Giant. And they they are out of they do have a New Hampshire location, Bridges Brothers who are in Exeter, and Piece by Piece who are also have a warehouse in New Hampshire. It's really important when you get um, estimates for moving that you're comparing apples to apples, and you really need to understand whether or not there's flexibility in a move date. There's inevitably things that happen right that you um, that may be out of your control. And you may have to, the week before a move, may have to change the date. If you have to change a date, a mover will likely charge you your full half or full deposit, depending on the time. So it's really important to understand what the cancellation rules are and those policies are, because it's super important, um, uh, because you can be faced with some uh, extra costs that you weren't anticipating. So I do suggest that those are all great movers, but again, when you get the, if you get get more than one estimate, compare apples to apples and really pay attention to what their cancellation fees are. All right. Or change. So, yeah. sorry to cut you off. <laughs> um, so there are a couple of questions just to reiterate, asking about getting a copy of the right sizing guide. So just to confirm, you will be getting a copy of this. If you registered for the event, uh, you will get an email in a few days uh, with the copy and also a recording of this webinar. So don't worry, it's coming to you. <laughs> um, next question is, who takes donations for things like duplicate tools? Um, we have some, we actually, we have someone who buys tools. Um, we always suggest to touch base with Habitat for Humanity. They may not be, you know, they may not sell it in their any of their restores, but they may want to use it in some of their building projects. Trade schools are a good place to ask if you have, you know, uh, quite an inventory of duplicate of duplicate tools. Um, and then there are some people that, as I said, they're that there are very specific buyers um, for for tools. Um, but there is a there is definitely a market and it varies based on what it is. But trade schools is is really a great option because they don't have huge budgets and they always love the donation. Um, we do have a couple of suggested places as well for oh, Massachusetts great. natives in the chat. So um, if you want to take a look at those, those are written in. Um, let's see. Uh, can the move manager at Riverwoods Exeter have knowledge about the local resources for donating and selling furniture and other items? Yes. Um, so especially with Dovetail as an example, we sort of work together uh, for different aspects of moving. Uh, Joe and his team has a huge wealth of knowledge. We've also witnessed things in our experience. So you can reach out to us both and we can communicate with one another and really kind of make this the best experience for you. Um, so absolutely. And that's true for all three of our communities. Um, one clarifying question. Uh, how does someone get scammed on a community giveaway site? It seems illogical since you're just giving stuff away. It's not so much the community um, the community giveaway site, it was really targeted more towards Facebook. So in this situation, a client received an offer to purchase something, say it was $300. And they said, oh, I just sent you a PayPal for three for 3000 Can you send me back the 2700 And this client ended up sending him back the 2700 So there, there are, and, and that person has no intention of ever buying any of the item. 
So they're very clever in, um, especially if you've agreed to sell something, they're very clever with, um, you know, oh, I'll prepay, always be aware of someone who wants, is very anxious to pay because they just want to be able to say that they made a mistake and that you have to refund them. That's so Facebook Marketplace is really and Craigslist again, any of those online places, I just ask that you show a little caution. I second that statement. I have witnessed it personally with with others. So definitely be yeah. erring on the side of caution. Um, let's see. I have a filled storage area. How can I find someone to look things over to buy or sell? Is that something your company does? Do you have resources? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we have resources that that do it. We always want to make sure that we're, you know, it, it's cost effective for the client. Sometimes if 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 it's a storage area, we have vendors who will come and go through and make suggestions about, um, you know, buying or selling or, you know, it, it, they'll can take items for donation. It doesn't make sense for us to interject ourselves as, you know, and, and bill for project management time when that clearly could be done by another vendor. So we partner with vendors. Um, and if, you know, you have specific questions, you can certainly reach out when you get the guide. It will have um, contact information on it. Thank you. Um, I think just in the essence of time, we'll answer one more question. And for those questions that are remaining, we can reach out to you individually. Um, some of them are more specific about Riverwoods. Some are more general. So um, this is a good, good question, though. Um, how does one deal with the reality of keeping things for the future use, um, repair, gifting, et cetera? but wrestling with the reality that there is not going to be that much time to actually get it done. The someday I'll get to that argument. That's when I say, you know, ask for help, right? You, it is, it's a lot of work. I mean, you've been in your homes for a long time um, and it is, it is going to take you time and it's difficult to try to tackle that on your own. So it can be well worth hiring a professional or asking for help in some regard, but it's, again, it's so important to have a plan to write down the the things that you want to deal in small bites of time and not try to do it all at once. My family is the true example of it's on my list. Um, and that list is forever growing. Um, <laughs> so it's true. Yeah. Um, but without, you know, with time in our consciousness will end here. So thank you, thank you, thank you again to Joe Scott. Again, You're he's welcome. the director of Move management at Dovetail Companies. So if this is of interest to you, if you think their services would be great to utilize, definitely reach out. Again, you'll have their information in the email sent to you. But otherwise, we hope you enjoyed the presentation and we'll see you at our next event. Thank you again. Thanks so much. <laughs>